Okay, I'm gonna tell you something that's mind blowing, but for women, you can fast and eat in accordance to your hormones. Whoa! <laughs> now that you understand your physiology, you have the power now to control it. Now you can say that I wanna be my best self and here's how I'm going to make that happen. What I wanna to talk to you about is so many people say right now that fasting is just another form of an eating disorder accepted. Now being the fasting MD, what do you say to that? Fasting is like exercise, right? You can exercise to the point where you injure your body. You can overdo it. You can become obsessed. And that's how intermittent fasting is. Mm -hmm. The way it's portrayed in the literature and in the social media realm is like this hard thing where you can't eat all day and then you push yourself to the max. And that can be very detrimental, just thinking in that way, mm -hmm. that it's a about deprivation, it's about control, it's about food is the enemy, and mm -hmm. that's like diet culture, right? So we wanna turn it back and flip it back and say, hey, just like a nature walk is so good for you as a form of exercise just for almost everyone, circadian fasting, looking at time of day, and eating with the rhythm of the earth and with yourself is a is equivalent to like a nature walk. Everyone will benefit mentally and physically. And so then it becomes, hey, you don't have to do 24 hour fast. You don't have to even do a 16 hour fast. Just do a 12 hour overnight fast and see how good you feel. And guess what? People around the world were eating for 16 hours a day. We don't take a 12 hour break. Taking a 12 hour natural biological break, that doesn't sound like fasting, but it is. That's what I call circadian fasting. Okay, we're gonna go deep on this. I get so excited about this sort of thing. So I wanna start with the benefits. Yeah. So just give me a couple of things, like you've said confidence, like yes. building your confidence. Um, by fasting, you can actually build your confidence. So what other things are um, going to be beneficial for people to really wanna dive deep on us on this interview today? You are gonna, you won't believe the clarity, BDNF, which is a brain neurotropic, who doesn't wanna grow their brain cells, right? You can grow your brain cells and then you want lower inflammation because inflammation leads to disease, brain fog, feeling sad, depression is inflammation. So by following circadian rhythms, sinking your life by fasting overnight, getting sunlight during the day, it builds up this um, brain gut um, connection that makes you feel more confident and actually lowers your risk of anxiety and depression. And so building up that gut health by intermittent fasting, by following the sun's rhythms of the day, you can actually boost the way you feel on a daily basis. People don't make that connection they think it's just about, oh, you feel how you feel right now, you know? Mm -hmm. No, you're feeling how the bacteria in your gut are feeling and what they walkie-talkie to your brain. When I first heard something like this, I was like, it doesn't make sense. Like, what you eat doesn't really affect your Like, I didn't understand the connection. And then one simple idea was like, oh, hangry is a thing. Yeah. So you don't eat, all of a sudden you get mad. Now, when you're yeah. mad, it feels real. Yeah. But really, it's just like, oh, no, you just need to fuel your body. Yeah. So with everything you're saying of how you show up to understand how fasting can impact anxiety and depression, God, that's freaking next level. Yeah. Like to me, that becomes a I'm always about don't judge yourself for the way you feel or the way that you are, but just look outside and see what can you do about it. Yeah. And so by you saying like this can really help depression, this can really help anxiety, yeah. this can help your confidence. Yes. Is now as a female, like I'm taking back the control of my own body. Yes. Women already have double the rates of anxiety and depression. Than men. Than men. Why is that? And that's the question. What is it that we have double the rates or is it that we are having hormonal issues? You know how you feel depressed or anxious right before your period? Is it that it's, it's being labeled as anxiety and depression because we don't know women's hormones. Perimenopause, the years before, 10 to 15 years before you hit menopause, you have hormonal swings that look like anxiety and depression. It's get diagnosed as anxiety and depression, but really it's that we are changing our hormones and we don't understand why we feel the way we feel. So that's why I talk so much about, hey, 
we know what we can do to actually boost your mood, to boost your energy, to boost your confidence through science, yet we leave it on the table. Wow, that's so fascinating. Okay, so let's talk about hormones because that's where you, you, you started. Um, how does fasting affect our hormones and how do we, I'm going to say manipulate, you may hate yes. that word, but how do we actually manipulate our hormones to make us feel the way we want to feel by using fasting? Okay, I'm going to tell you something that's mind-blowing, but for women, you can fast and eat in accordance to your hormones. You have never been told that there's a way to eat, to fast, to exercise that actually works with your hormones mm. and cycles you through a monthly plan that is based in biology. So as you know, with women, uh, most women have a 28 day cycle. And so I always say, learn your cycle. Mm -hmm. It's a vital sign. And then you can coordinate your fasting, your eating, your exercise, your life to that cycle and your life will feel so much better. You'll feel more in control and you'll feel happier because you'll understand what's happening. Yeah, the vital sign thing's so fascinating, it's so powerful. So take me through what that first step is. So people are listening, they're really on board. Okay, I wanna improve my yes. depression or I just wanna yes. feel good about myself. Yes. I wanna find the confidence. What's that first step? So how do you recognize okay. your cycle? Yes. Um, take me through the step okay. by step of that. This is the simplest way. I've tried a million different ways. People, sometimes they just know, you know, okay, uh, I put it on my calendar, like I put it on my calendar. But if you're new to this and you're like, oh, wait, you can control how you feel on a daily basis by learning more about your hormones, yes. The day of your period, for most women, they're uh, having a period every 20 days, right? The day one of your period, the couple of days before that, you feel like shit. Those couple of days before you feel like the world is crumbling, you hate your partner, mm -hmm. your business sucks, you're never going anywhere in life. And that is not you talking, mm -hmm. that is your hormones talking. Your estrogen is really low and your serotonin, the feel good hormone is really low. And that's why people reach for the bag of candy that's why we're eating all the chocolate. That's why we're crying because our life just feels awful right now. Mm -hmm. But understand, I'm telling you women, understand that don't make any rash decisions about your life during those couple of days. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like, oh my God, I might need to go on medications because of this couple of days or I need to end my relationship. Wait, mm -hmm. just wait till day one, day two, day, probably day three of your period when hormones reset and watch how you feel. So I tell people those three to five days before, you don't have to fast. Guess what, you don't have to exercise. You want to concentrate on self-care. So if that means fasting 12 hours, great. If that means going for nature walks instead of your high intensity workouts, you need to give your body a little reprieve because your hormones have dropped mm. during that what we call the PMS week. In medical terms, we call it the late luteal phase. So even just learning that one fact will change your life. That late luteal phase, the week before your period, you're going to feel more tired. Your hormones have dropped. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel like you can't work out and fast as much. And you're going to probably feel like shit. And that's part of it. And is this everything you're saying, is this the difference then between the idea behind men fasting and then the idea behind women yes. fasting is that obviously the men don't have the same rhythm yes. and so they can almost, do they reboot every day whereas women is like, it's the 28 yes. days. For example, we have a testosterone spike at the middle of our cycle. So like after the period week, there's one more week and then day 14, like the middle of our cycle, we get a testosterone spike, which men have all the time. Yeah. During that time, you might be able to do fasting similar to men. Uh, to a man, you may see that, oh, you have a little more capability of, so now we know that there is a hormonal connection mm. between fasting and hormones, but guess what? There's zero studies in the science that ever looked at it. There's rat studies that are poor studies that don't even you know understand 13 studies in the whole literature. So what we're talking about now is not talked about. Yeah. This is brand new information. You can't just retrofit right. the yeah. information for men, for women. We know that we can't. We actually know, we have proven that there's many conditions across medicine where, for example, a, sleeping, a popular sleeping pill called Ambien, mm -hmm. 
it works completely differently in women. Metabolized completely differently, affects hormones. You can't just give the same dose or a little bit smaller dose to, it doesn't work in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so we can't just assume that men's physiology is going to be the same. It's not, we've yeah. proven that. All right, so I love that. So day 14, yeah. roughly. So guys, if, you, if you're listening, put on your, your calendar, day 14, this is when I get the spike of testosterone. This is when what I have more confidence, more energy, yes. break that down for me. You can go harder on your workouts. You'll have more confidence. You're at the peak of your, um, of your energy, your power. So if you could schedule your life <laughs> around I love this. the last couple of days before your period, the late luteal phase, don't make b big decisions for your business, for your mm. life, for your relationships. Mm. And then middle of the cycle, day 14, if you can catch that couple of days, you're going to feel in your power. This is the time to take advantage of it. If you have the option to do something big and confident and bold, that's the time. Okay, I love this because literally you're taking me through a way that I can not judge myself for feeling the way I do, but using it as a way to really, again, like show up on, on no, not to show up today because it's, it's not going, you're not gonna actually be able to be your full self even if you want to be. Now that you understand your physiology, you have the power now to control it. Mm -hmm. Now you can say that I wanna be my best self and here's how I'm going to make that happen by scheduling things the way to p empower my biology. You just so beautifully, eloquently in your book talk about how fasting then really does impact your gut. Yeah. And I really wanna talk about gut health. A lot of my audience already know that I've been suffering from massive gut health for six years to the point where when it first happened, I couldn't stand up for longer than five minutes at a time. My hair was falling out, my nails were brittle, and it took me over a year to even be able to eat more than like four or five different ingredients. Wow. I was that malnutritioned. And of course that, the gut health just completely falling apart, affected every aspect of my life, from my sleep to how I felt about myself, my confidence, mm -hmm. my moods, my mm -hmm. relationship, everything. So I really wanted to talk about the importance of gut health. And so if you don't mind taking me through, yeah. how on earth fasting actually helps with your gut health? Okay, so you're all about radical confidence, right? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> so your confidence right now, your anxiety level, your um, happiness, it's coming from your gut. And it is these bacteria can determine. We know that when you're feeling happy and if you're always happy, your gut bacteria look different from someone who's always feeling bad. And so it's fascinating to me. So then you think, oh, wait, if gut bacteria have the power to change your mood, they also have the power to change your personality and your confidence levels. You can control this through the gut brain connection. And this is where, you know, we blow open the world of mental health because it's not about taking something for your brain anymore. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dreams, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Yes, okay, so what's the first step? How does somebody use or assess their gut health and then use fasting as a way to improve the gut health so that they can show up to be confident and happy? When, you know, that's the million dollar question, right? So people are designing probiotics or, you know, this right. and that. What we do know is that increasing the number of gut bacteria and the diversity, we want diverse. We want all different types of bacteria. And right now in our guts is modern people. We have less diverse and less bacteria. I mean, there's a hypothesis that says that the more 
sterile your gut becomes, the worse the outcomes of health, depression, autoimmune disease, asthma, allergies, food allergies. Um, and so what we do by something like sinking to the sun, circadian fasting, is that we're saying, oh, you know that gut bacteria that live in these bowels, these dark bowels, they have circadian rhythms and they actually need to live and eat with the sun also. And so it's once you understand that, oh, I have power to grow these bacteria, I can nurture these bacteria. It's crazy to me that we have found that 5,000 years ago, our, they've been able to sequence gut um, of people that lived then. Their bacteria were more diverse mm -hmm. and they had more. And so we've, of course, come a long way of to modern times and we've done amazing things. But in some ways, we've gone backwards. Mm -hmm. And we have tribes today that still live similar, uh, called the Hazda tribe in Tanzania. They're like hunter-gatherers. They live, they're one of the only places in the world where they still live kind of in the traditional way that we think was present 5,000 years ago. Their guts, yes, they have more diversity. They have more bacteria. What are they doing? They don't eat first thing in the morning and they don't eat late at night. And they eat fresh, diverse foods and they're eating, you know, s small meals all day long. So we learn a lot from that kind of world. And we're saying, oh, yeah, that makes sense. There's no refrigerators, microwaves, or drive throughs at midnight um, back then. Mm. So maybe you shouldn't be having your biggest meal of the day, you know, right before you go to bed at midnight. When I think about it and the way I talk about it with people and in my book is, Think about biologically how to support yourself. Now, you don't have to be, Lisa and I don't have to be, we don't have to be exactly the same. You gotta listen to your body. If you finish eating at 7 p.m., I can finish eating at 8 p.m. Um, or you can finish at five and I can, it doesn't have to be an exact time, but it has to be two to three hours before bed to be optimal. And when you wake up, don't just roll out of bed and have a glass of orange juice. You know, maybe go for a little walk, go for a fasted workout like, biologically you're supposed to. You know, back then they didn't have something at the bedside or right at the kitchen right when they got up. You know, maybe take your time to have your first meal of the day. It doesn't have to be noon or one or three. It can be just an hour after you get up, get some sunlight, move around, have your first meal. Honestly, everything you're saying, like to me, the when, <clears throat> I thought was crazy when I first heard it. I was like, what do you mean? What does it matter when you eat and then how you eat? I was yeah. like, surely it's all about what you eat. Yeah. And what I realized was, I was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to give it a shot, right? What do I have to lose? I was in such gut disarray. Um, and anyone listen, just give it a shot. Yeah. When I started to eat my last meal at like 5, 5.30 yes. and I go to bed at 9. Yes. It was a game changer. It's a game changer. For anybody out there who wants to start, just go two to three hours before bed and it will change your life. Yeah, I literally never understood it until I tried it. So I like the idea of like, just give it a shot, see how it feels for you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, as I was listening to your book, I somehow had molded my own idea of as long as it's three hours before bed, I'm fine. So if let's say on a weekend, I was going to bed at midnight, I'd allow myself to um, eat at like nine o'clock yeah. and it was fine. Yeah. But when I listened to your book, I mean, it makes so much sense as you're talking about the circadian rhythm, it's like, well, hang on a minute, back in the day um, where our guts were way healthier, we stopped eating when the sun went down. Yeah. And I was like, oh, because normally on the weekends, I do have a bit more of a distressed stomach, slightly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I was like, you're right. I had so locked in my head about it being three hours that I didn't combine the three hours with the, the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythms are everything. I mean, 80% of our body's functions depend on circadian rhythms. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Medicine went to these discoveries because we knew about it, but we didn't know how impactful it is mm. for our health mm -hmm. to sleep. Um, our growth hormone, our repair mechanisms happen at night. So having darkness and having sleep is so important. And then having bright light and natural light from the sun is so important during the day and living and eating with that pattern. So when we talk about gut health, our gut bacteria know what time it is because of how you're eating.
and they get because they have their own inner clocks like they have a watch mm -hmm. but they also depend on you to give signals and when you're eating at midnight you're giving them a signal that it's daytime and they get confused so you need what your gut will improve when you live closer to circadian mm -hmm. rhythms because now they're in sync mm -hmm. with you with the circadian rhythms with their own clocks wow and one thing i also want to add that you're saying is so freaking powerful because i've gone through it myself so many gut issues i really freaking hope people are listening closely to what you're saying girl because once i started to realize what i had done to my gut i had taken way too many antibiotics and it completely destroyed the bacteria in my gut I don't consider myself an emotion, a very emotional person. Like if you think about like us on the spectrum, yeah. right? Where over here is like super high emotion and over here is like really non-emotional. I'm very close to this side of being non-emotional. Um, outwardly, like I'm able to kind of talk myself through things. Dude, when my gut went to crap, I was the most emotional being I'd ever, ever been. Yeah. I was bursting into tears in business meetings. Yeah. Um, and so understanding the power power of the gut mm. is why I do what I do now which is exactly why I wanted you on like this to me is there's like you said it's not about the mind it is a oh when do you eat it's so people may hate me saying this but it's so controllable yeah it is I mean I was in a, I couldn't totally relate to you and so many people can relate to you because I was never an emotional wreck and I had been in my training and I was like right out, right after I finished my training, I had this amazing job and I had all these opportunities, but my gut health was so poor that I couldn't sleep. I was so anxious. I couldn't sleep at night and I, my moods were so out of control. I'm, I really thought that I was having an out of body experience. And when I said women are not served, that's what I was thinking is like at that time, I was given options to medicate. Oh, you're feeling anxiety? Take anti-anxiety. Oh, you're feeling not good with your gut health? Take this. And I realized like once I understood, hey, I have the power to fix this myself. Mm -hmm. And of course, note, if you need medications, people need medication. It's amazing to take what you need. But at some level, you have to combine that with the power of what you know now to improve your gut health, to improve your mind through that mind-gut connection. And it's, it is controllable. So one of the things I've heard you say um, is about sanitizing. Yeah. And so for me, I was, because I was getting sick a lot, because yeah. I had a bad gut, because yeah. I was an, on antibiotics, yeah. I was so worried about getting sick that I started sanitizing more and then in sanitizing more and taking more antibiotics, I'm just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Yeah. And you talk about in your book, and you've spoken very eloquently um, about how sanitizing and killing the bacteria is like the modern day thing, but actually it's doing ourselves a detriment. And so since I heard that, I just like almost like don't wash my hands. I yeah. mean, obviously I do too because of COVID, yeah. but like I, I sanitize way less now. You'll be shocked. Okay, I was in the office the other day and a patient came to me and she said, I've done everything right. I've, you know, stayed home during the whole COVID pandemic. I haven't been with family and friends, but now that things are opening up, um, I'm starting to go out again. And I got COVID three times. So she said she got it once, then a month later she traveled again, she got it again. She got it for the third time. And I told her, I, and what I would tell you, Lisa, you need to repopulate your mm, gut. Mm -hmm. Your immune system needs to see other people, other bacteria, other illnesses. It needs that stimulation to be able to be as healthy as it can be. It's not about over sanitizing and avoiding all contact. In fact, you want to, once you are healthy and once other people are healthy, you want that interaction. We know that children who grow up with lots of siblings, with lots of animals and on a farm have stronger immune systems because they are getting dirt all the time. Yeah. And you know, the only thing we can think of is not necessarily dirt, but the bacteria of the animals, of the other children, of being in nature. So when you think about it for yourself, you gotta replicate that mm. nature 
for whatever reason, brings bacteria. Being around others, whether you're interacting with them or not, brings bacteria into your system that's healthy. And if one of the quickest ways to be healthy, as you know, you know, you catch ideas and things from, so I love hanging out with you because I'm catching ideas in your energy. I'm also catching your gut microbiome and you're catching mine. And when you spend a lot of time with your husband, for example, you're sharing um, a gut microbiome with them. And we now know that having good social contacts can reduce your risk of death by 45%. Whoa! <laughs> relationships reduced your risk of death by 45%. Good relationships or any relationships? Okay, great <laughs> question. Good relationships. And you know how, uh, you know how to tell? So I looked into this because I was like so shocked. Wait, we eat all this healthy food, we exercise, but there's something that can reduce your risk of death by 45% that we don't talk about? Right. So the way you think about it, so these studies were done over seven or eight years of time on people who had re close relationships. And what I looked into, what are the questions that you can ask yourself? There's two questions Go you on. can ask yourself about the people in your life. Number one, would you call them for an inconvenient favor? Meaning it's not something that would be super easy for them to do, but an incon would you feel comfortable calling them? And then number two, would you call that person with good news? Or would you say, oh, they're, they're busy, they're, they're too busy for me, or would they actually be excited for you? Are they shared in your joy of what you're doing with your life? If the person does not pass through either of those gates, they're probably not, I mean, there's exceptions, but they're probably not the close contact, the relationships that are really improving your health. So use those two gates. I tell people, you can find out a lot about your life by thinking about those two gates. There's some people who will go through both of them in a second. Like you're like, yeah, you know what? If I ask them for a favor of some kind or, and I had something really great happen to me, that person would feel joy for me. If you're like, you know, that person's really busy. I don't want to bother them. And I don't want to ask them for a favor. And also, I don't really think they would be that happy for me mm -hmm. if something great happened to me because it's almost like kind of a frenemy relationship. And women, you know, there's a lot of that going around. That's, that's not a healthy relationship. And that can tell you a lot about how to structure your life and how to manage your energy and how to improve your health and your mindset and your confidence and your happiness level. This is so amazing and huge. Um, I love that you gave it such a tactical um, explanation as well of how to know. And as you were talking, I was like, God, does that mean that let's say you surround yourself with people who have high anxiety and high depression? Is your gut microbiome going to adjust so that are you more likely to be depressed and anxious yourself? Yes. Yes. Holy smokes. Just like you know, um, I'm, I'm sure you and Tom talk about surrounding yourself with successful people. Right, yeah. Surrounding yourself with happy people. The mindset, the people the that mindset. have the growth mindset. But yeah. it's also the gut. Honestly, I don't think I would have believed it. I'm always very honest. Yeah. So I don't think I would have believed that. But when I think about how, I can't explain it. But when, you know, five women are living together, they're... Uh, cycles sync yes. up like even that it's like I don't know why yeah but it's obviously fact and so when you say about that microbiome it seems so surreal to me and yet so freaking powerful yeah I'll tell you this is what's going to change your mind Lisa all right I love it you can take humans who have schizophrenia and you can identify them by the way their microbiome looks scientists were blinded who had schizophrenia, who didn't. They could tell from their gut. And the next step, they took the bacteria from the schizophrenic person and put it into mice. And they mixed up the mice and they said, well, they were able to pick out the mice that had the gut microbiome from the schizophrenic patients because they displayed schizophrenic properties. They had a personality change by transplanting the bacteria. Oh my God. So I just have to take a minute. That is so freaking huge. And 
When I first had gut issues, because it was six years ago, it was actually before like a lot of the science is like, you know, the, the information is out there. And so when I was going to the doctors, someone actually, one of the doctors, very reputable, was like, you, you should have a fecal transplant. Yeah. And that's like, in case people don't know what fecal transplant is, it's exactly what you're thinking. It's, it's what it sounds like. <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. And their, their thing was, well, look, we take someone healthy fecal matter mm -hmm. who eats well who you know has like um good genetics or whatever yeah. or um and then we'll put it into you and what happens is your body adapts and your microbiome will adapt to them and i was yeah. like that sounds hideous but look i'm always the person of like no judgment but what actually is going to work yeah and so when they told me i was like okay well let me really consider this and my husband started doing the study the research and he's like oh hell no he's like because if they have either biomarkers yes. or they have depression or they have yes. anxiety babe you have a fecal transplant and now all of a sudden i suffer from depression yeah exactly you can take their personality That's not even so just depression anxiety you can take their personality traits, they will become a part of you. So, but think about it in the positive way. There is a company out there with a great idea that they said, let's take athletes, world-class athletes, and let's take their fecal matter and turn it into a pill, like a probiotic pill for people who want the mindset, Whoa. who want the athletic boost. And you know, if you think about it that way, there's some potential there. Um, you know, we're not there yet. I don't recommend anybody go out and take poop pills from <laughs> your favorite yeah. athlete, but the potential, right? And, you know, you can transfer diseases and you can transfer all kinds of biomarkers, like you said, you know, cancer, there are disease mm. risks. So you don't want to do that, but the potential of how you're, you spending time, yes. you sharing food or just a space with someone can help change your gut health. That's why for women especially, who you surround yourself with becomes you. It becomes your thoughts, it becomes your microbiome, it becomes your energy, and so you need to guard that. And if you don't have boundaries around who you spend your time with, you're gonna end up becoming like the person you hate. Who, God, when, because I've always been a fan of like, you know, uh, who are the people you surround yourself with? And really for me, I always thought about it from a mindset perspective. Yeah. Like when someone's a Debbie Downer and they're always around you, it starts to like weigh on you. And so that I kind of totally understood. But go, it never freaking dawned on me about your microbiome. And what we were talking about, the fecal matter to me, that's so powerful because it just highlights the importance of your gut health, right? Yeah. And that's what it's kind of saying is that, look, if this can happen, now put that into perspective of the things you're eating, how yes. you're eating, how quickly you're eating, like even the speed of eating. Right. And you have to remember that these microbes, like I told you before, I kind of refer to them as like little creatures. Yeah. And they have, they're like your army and they're calling, they're on a walkie talkie with your immune system all the time. So for you, when you're trying to decrease your inflammation, you're trying to heal your gut, that communication between the micro microbes and your immune system is really important. And then they communicate with your brain, they communicate with your hormones. Mm. And so all of that like energy, focus, happiness, it's all the decisions are, be are being made right then, then and there. So you have power to control it through food, through when you eat, what time of day you get sunlight, um, how much nature time, how much movement. Um, exercise, of course, is an amazing way to boost your gut health. And so there are things we can be doing. Okay, I definitely want to talk about diet and what we can eat. But before yeah. we do that, I want to talk about sleep. Yeah. Because as we've already addressed, right, the fasting can really have an impact on your gut health, on your hormones, but really like the sleep element as well is so powerful because I had a friend, or I have a friend, I'm not going to name her name, but she said to me, I've been sleeping for three hours a night for seven years. I was like, how are you functioning? Yeah. And she was just like, oh, actually, the sleep doesn't bother me. But now, of course, she has massive health issues. Yes. And so I would love for you to help us understand yeah. the impact of sleep on how we feel, but then also how fasting can actually help us sleep yeah. so we can actually get the sleep benefits. Um, the fasting piece, Lisa, is very easy to understand. When you think about the gut bacteria, they need sleep also. They need to rest. They need repair. 
So when you're eating at all hours of the night and all hours of the day, they never get that time. So that concept, that's the basic concept of intermittent fasting, is that I'm not telling you to follow any fad or oh, diet. Right. Just think about it as sleep and rest and recovery for your gut bacteria. I love that framing. And sleep is, as you know, one of the biggest ways to help you on your healing journey, mental, physical health, right? That's when all the magic happens, the repair processes happen. We can't be doing everything all day at once, so our genes, our body cells are programmed that when it's night, that's when repair and renewal happens. Mm -hmm. So you can't just flip your script. You can't just say, oh, forget it. I'm never going to sleep and I want repair and renewal. No, mm -hmm. those cells have a clock and they know there's a time to repair and there's a time to metabolize and be awake. Okay. So that's fundamentally why you need sleep is because each one of our cells in our body has a clock and needs to flip the switch from metabolism daily functions to repair and mm. renewal. So then that makes sense. That's why healing happens. That's why people who sleep, you know, end up feeling happier. That's why their brain is clearer. And that's why, you know, we talk about beauty, natural beauty from inside out. The real beauty sleep is happening. There's a a hormone called human growth hormone. People abuse it all the time. Uh, athletes, athletes, yeah. <laughs> and they want to be younger and mm -hmm. they want to be, you know, they want to recover faster. But you know when you get that natural burst of human growth hormone is one hour after going to bed. It's Ooh. at 11 p.m. for most people. It's the burst. You get a second small burst early in the morning, but the big burst, don't miss your anti-aging window. It is your free dose of HGH. So if I go to bed at 1 a.m., I'm screwed? You're screwed. Wow, I didn't know. Like You will still get it, but you won't get it in the doses you want to get it. Yeah. You want to find your natural circadian rhythm. Like, you know, really, people think that they're night owls, but if you put yourself in a cave, like go on a camping trip, Really find your natural circadian rhythms when you naturally wake up and when you naturally go, and it's going to be similar for most people. And one after one hour after you go to bed. So I tell women roughly around 11 p.m. is your big natural burst of anti-aging hormone. That's crazy. And so one of the things that my friend said though that I found fascinating, I'd really like to talk about, is that she said that because she was, she was like, I've never eaten healthier. So yeah. she was like making sure she was getting her vegetables. Yeah. She was making sure she was getting her protein. But she, because she was only sleeping for like three hours and she was under tremendous stress for literally like seven years, um, she said that she gained so much weight and she mm. can't lose it. And mm. she was like, I don't understand. And I was like, well, what did you do differently? She's like, all I did is shorten how much sleep, sleep I got. Can I ask you this? Did she voluntarily shorten her sleep? Yes. And how old is she? In her 40s. Okay. So I knew that because in our 40s, we never get told this. And this happens to the 50% of the population. In our 40s, our hormones are changing. And what happens is that women will have trouble sleeping. They will have trouble with their weight. They'll have trouble with their energy and their emotions. And no one is telling them why. Mm. And it is happening to 50% of our, more than 50% now, and no one is supporting these women. There is a 10 year process before menopause that happens, and your people gain weight, they'll gain 30 pounds in one year, they won't be able to sleep, they'll find their health is deteriorating, their mental health is deteriorating. And why? Because nobody explained to them what's happening and let me explain it to you in oh, just they're saying it's normal oh it's normal yes. yeah yeah oh you're just getting older yeah That's yeah so you know you're getting older what's happening is that our hormones is like a a, a toothpaste tube as we get into our 40s uh for most people sometimes even 35 and above um that toothpaste sometimes it's a full squeeze and sometimes it's a splatter and sometimes there's nothing mm -hmm. that comes out, okay? Because we're at the end of the toothpaste tube. When nothing comes out or just a splatter comes out, your body's like, oh, wait, we need more estrogen. We need, so they send signals to the brain. Hey, we need to get more, but there's not more around. Um, but our fat cells make estrogen. 
so we can grow those oh. and we can release more estrogen in response especially around the belly and you know when our estrogen's low our serotonin's low so we feel kind of not great about ourselves and guess what our sleep is disturbed because serotonin and melatonin are so connected and nobody's telling us wait why does some weeks it almost seems like i'm pms or i'm in this funk for a whole month mm. and then the next month you might be fine mm. no hot flashes no sleep disturbances no you know your body starts to respond better and so that's what's happening wow all right so what can we do about that yeah so, well that <laughs> that is one the biggest thing lisa is understanding that my mom i remember she went through menopause around the time when i was um getting married that couple of years before this whole perimenopause and she thought she was going crazy mm. People said, oh, you're just getting old. You're stressed because your daughter's getting married. You know, you're getting, this is a problem. Of, and women from ages of 30s all the way to 50s are feeling like they're going crazy. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not fair. That's, we're doing a disservice, right? We want to empower them that, hey, this is what's happening to your body. Mm -hmm. So if you're noticing you can't sleep, it's because your serotonin's or your melatonin's off. Um, if you're gaining weight around your uh, middle, uh, it could be because your hormones are in flux and you can't just you know supplement and take um, you know uh, hormones and everything goes away you can do things though to support it this is a time when you have to understand your physiology so it has to be very personalized mm -hmm. so anything i say can be different for woman to woman right but nature walking walking and especially walking in nature for some reason has an effect on women, and especially during that time, that's very positive. So it calms your stress hormones. It helps you lose weight because you're moving, but you're not stressing your body into mm -hmm. a, you know, a high intensity cortisol state. And so I say the secret for women in those years is to go for nature walks. 10,000 steps a day would be a good way to think about it. And just use time to move, exercise, and calm your brain. Maybe you take a podcast with you, you know, listen to Lisa's <laughs> podcast. Maybe you have some quiet time, maybe you're in nature, but a simple, simple tool, a therapy option that includes mm. no medications at all. And does it matter what time of day you do it? Like, would that work better? Do you sleep better yeah. if you do it before bed? You sleep better if you do it in the morning. The morning sunlight resets your circadian rhythms. They're like, okay, um, you know, now we know when to release the melatonin tonight. Now we know you need to be alert and um, uh, with it right mm. now. And so it resets those circadian rhythms, which helps your hormones, which helps your energy levels, which helps your mood, and then it'll help your sleep at night. Oh my God, so that makes sense. It makes total sense. And then, my, so my husband, I just traveled to England. And so my husband's like, now remember, go outside as soon as you wake up the next day because that will help you with the jet lag. Yes. And I did. It happened to be lovely and sunny in England. And so two days in a row, I had zero jet lag when I was there. Yeah. Is that why then? That's why. If you want a simple cure for jet lag or just daily jet lag, yeah. which a lot of people have. Daily jet lag. <laughs> It, you know, weekend jet lag, you wake up on a Monday morning and you're like, oh my God, I feel so exhausted because your sleep schedule is so off. Go out and just get a couple of minutes of direct light into your eyes. From your retina, it goes to your brain directly to the circadian centers um, and it resets. That's amazing. I just want people to hear that. Don't wear sunglasses. Yes. And don't, and go outside. And go outside. Don't look out just window. lights. <laughs> lights are a fraction of natural light like it is um if you say cloudy day say some people say i live in you know somewhere where it's never sunny and i'm like well that's still ten thousand lux of light whereas a indoor light would be a fraction of that wow yeah i heard you say which i was like what that um lack of sleep can affect your dna yes your the lack of sleep affects you in ways on a cellular level when we're talking about aging, right, we now know that people age differently. Mm. So your age on your license oh. or your passport is different than your cellular age. That's and if you want to change your age, a simple step is getting enough sleep 
or at least two to three nights a week. I know, I get it. And especially, you know, for women with their hormones and changing, it's not always possible to get it every day. Mm-hmm. And small children and responsibilities. Two to three days a week, aim to get a good night's sleep. I aim for two days a week of adequate sleep where I feel like, oh, I feel good today. You know, two days a week, that's it. And you start to eat and live with circadian rhythms, improve your diet quality, you can anti-age that cell. You can reverse some of that damage. You can look 20 years younger. You can feel 20 years younger by taking these steps. That's incredible. Um, And just some tactical things I've heard you um, really give great advice on is so a couple of things on the environment of when you're, like how you're sleeping. So like the temperature, if you can just break down a couple of those little tips for people. Um, I became obsessed (laughs) with sleep hygiene. We call it sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene. Um, Because a nighttime routine is really important. Um, Just as much as we hear about morning routines all the time, right? A nighttime routine is really important. Have a set routine, whether you're traveling, whether you're busy, just a few things that you do every night. So I know the importance of circadian rhythms, and I've been talking about this Mm -hmm. this whole time. So turn off the bright lights. The overhead lights at Target and the grocery store, they are really detrimental to your circadian rhythms because it's telling the brain it's time to wake up when it's supposed to be telling the brain it's time to wind down. Mm. So you want to change the lighting in your home, even just dim the lights. Um, Do things that don't require screens um, as much as possible. So having the TV on the back in in the background right before bed is not a good idea. Um, You want to at least guard your body. So when you look at your phone, the bright light, it it delays your melatonin. One one bout of bright light delays your melatonin by 90 minutes. Whoa! So then nine you wonder... Nine zero. Nine zero. Jesus! So then you wonder why, you know, people can't sleep in this world, yeah. right? We're, we're a world full, full of screens that have, like, throw light into our eyes, telling our brain, hey, it's danger. There's, there's danger. You can't go to sleep. Mm. There's something you need to stay awake from. For because you know if you think about it where how we're wired we're wired for those danger signals so you want to make your room cold you want to make your room dark dim the lights try to stay off of um, phones and computers even for an hour 30 minutes 20 minutes Mm -hmm. before you go to bed and that's even hard for most people right and make it dark even ambient light in the room can be detrimental so if you can't wear a face mask Mm -hmm. to block out the light Make sure that you're, you know, haven't eaten a huge meal right before you're going to bed. You can use, um, you know, things like magnesium, melatonin can definitely help, especially when you're traveling and you're trying to reset it. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a way to kind of help get that reset. Very tiny doses of melatonin, like just 0.5 to 1.5 milligrams, which is a, a fraction of what most people are taking. And then magnesium to relax the body, that can be really helpful as well. Um, And just having maybe a nighttime routine. I even have, so the chai latte that I make that I was mentioning, that's actually caffeine free and sugar free. So I will even have a half a scoop of that, keeps you in the fasting state at night before bed. It's a ritual. Then I do my skincare because, you know, it's what do you do when you don't have your screens and the TV Mm -hmm. and, you know, bright lights? You do a ritual, you do your prayer, you do a reading with a dim light, and um, then you're ready for bed. Okay, I love this because going back to what you said earlier about like how we can be, feel younger, more yeah. energized, um, so sleep being such a big part of this, um, do blue blockers work in the same thing? Like, can I just wear blue blockers and still watch television? I, I think that what happens is blue blockers, they don't block all the harmful light mm. and Um, people just then blast themselves with light and just wear blue blockers thinking that that's an adequate way. What I suggest instead, even better, is turn off the TVs first, dim the lights um, uh, at the same time as you turn off the TV, and then right before you go to bed, turn off the phone. And maybe it just means 20 to 30 minutes while you do your nighttime routine. Maybe it's just 15 minutes. Mm. But learn not to be looking at a bright screen. You can now iPhones, you can put... Um, That's what uh, the next uh, question I was going to ask. Yeah, nighttime. can you put night? Mode. Yeah. yeah. And you want to do that on your computers. You okay. want to do that on all your screens. But really, you want to get into the habit of living more in sync 
with your circadian rhythms mm -hmm. because that's going to improve your mindset, the way you feel on a daily basis in addition to helping you look and feel younger. And so why does temperature make a difference when you sleep? So the thing that makes you fall asleep is a one degree drop in your core body temperature. Ooh. So how do you get there the fastest? You know, some people take a shower, a hot shower, because then your body temperature can drop or cold. Oh, you take hot so yeah. that when you get you out, it drops. You cold or hot or alternate um, between. Because you want that core body temperature to drop. And by making your room cold, by, you know, having an environment that helps your body drop that core body temperature. Mm. And guess what? Goes back to women and hormones again. Guess why women, you know, can't sleep? They're getting a hot flash, their core body temperature rises, wakes them up in the middle of sleep, and then they're in a situation where they feel exhausted in the morning. Also, I'll tell you something that's mind-blowing. Women's circadian rhythms are slightly different from men's. It's slightly off by six minutes, shorter. And so what happens is, you might naturally need a little more sleep to reset those circadian rhythms. And so that explains to me a lot of my physiology because I do need more sleep than my partner. And I'm like, why is that? And it's many of my female friends. Mm. And it's because we think um, that it's based in circadian rhythms. Oh my God. Um, all right, I want to talk about inflammation now because um, in tying that to the types of food that we should be eating, I know yes. that that's something that a lot of people can be super interested in. Going back to the control element of like, um, at least I know, right? If yeah. I eat this sugary yeah. thing, yeah. if I eat this cake, yeah. then I at least know how I'm going to feel. And because I've had so many gut issues, I'm so aware of what food's going to impact me in which way. So I know when I eat sugar, I'm actually going to feel way more groggy, way more tired. Yes. Um, I have to eat it early in the day because it actually bothers my stomach than if I ate something healthy later on in the day. Um, and so the inflammation part is yeah. a thing that I didn't understand until I had the gut issue. So if you can actually explain to me yeah. what the detriment is to having inflammation in your body yeah. and then how fasting and then what we eat can impact that. Such a, I mean, this is a, the million dollar question that can unpack so much because inflammation is not just in your stomach. Inflammation is um, in your brain, mm. uh, depression. It is in your body, the way you feel. It's, it's uh, obesity, diabetes, all of these things are linked to inflammation. So inflammation is total body health. And that's where we're going wrong in this world. We are eating foods that are so inflammatory. There are signals, inflammation is signals in our body that there's a problem. So when you eat something that your body does not recognize this food or is toxic, like alcohol, for example. Alcohol is a toxin, right? Mm. Or you eat something that is detrimental to your body. Your body sends off signals that, hey, we need to take care of this issue. Um, there's some inflammation going on here. We're going to fix what's going on. We've got to recognize what it is. We've got to get rid of it. So like alcohol, right? So your brain gets these signals that, hey, there's some issues here. Let's not concentrate on anything else, we gotta kind of fix our issues. So you're gonna feel tired and you're gonna feel down. If you, if any of you have a dog, um, you know that the, when they're sick, they just sleep a lot. Mm -hmm. and that's inflammation. There's the signs in your body, the inflammation signs say, hey, we need to rest our brain so we can fix what's going on mm -hmm. here. And imagine that's how we're living on a, on a daily basis because chronic inflammation is such a problem and it's because of the way we eat and the way we live. All right, so how do we start to identify if we have the inflammation and yes. then what can we actually do about it? I can guarantee you that every single one of us has some level of inflammation and that's good, right? When you hurt your foot, you want the inflammatory signals, you want it to get swollen, um, you want it to send signals to your brain that it's painful because that's normal, mm -hmm. that's a normal it's process. It's saying fix it. Fix it, right. it's a sign, right? But when we're eating foods all the time, that's what I want to emphasize to people. You don't need to be 100% organic, sugar-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, and, and you know, perfect. It's just about decreasing the amount of inflammation. If you're eating, I, and I go back to alcohol because it's the easiest toxin to understand. Mm -hmm. If you drink alcohol in the morning, 
afternoon, after lunch, in the evening, at night, you're going to feel like crap the next day. Mm. Your body's not going to be able to handle that much toxin in that little time. And that's what we're doing with our food. We're eating mm. sugar, emulsifiers, toxic chemicals in our food morning, afternoon, after lunch, as a snack, as a drink, at night, right before bed. And then you expect our body to be able to clear all that by mm. the next day. Ooh, that's so strong. And um, I remember when when I started having the gut issues, obviously there was just foods I couldn't eat. So then as I started to rebuild my gut and started to introduce things, go, it was like night and day. The second I drink alcohol, the next day, guaranteed, the next day, I wake up with joint pain. Yeah. If that's inflammation. Right. And so now thinking though that it's, for me, I so recognize it because I've gone so long without it. And right. because now I don't drink very often, yeah. if I do, my body immediately, like I can feel the difference. Yeah. But I think about the people that don't realize that they're in utter, like permanent inflammation state with the foods that they're eating. Um, I posted something, Lisa, that said, until you experience an alcohol-free, a toxic food, a toxic person-free life, until you experience that, you don't know what you're missing. Mm -hmm. So do a detox of your friends, of your environment, of the food that you eat, of the alcohol and the thoughts, that, and just see how you feel. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect all the time. It doesn't mean you have to live like that but at least you know what it feels like to feel good. So how does fasting help with the inflammation? Fasting is an proven, it has been proven to reduce inflammation in the body. There are very few things that are proven to reduce inflammation of the body. It's nutrition, it's fasting, it's circadian rhythms. The three things that I talk about, mm -hmm. they lower inflammation. So we have these inflammation markers we can check in the blood, um, like TNF-alpha and CRP. These are just markers that show, is our body in inflammatory state or not? And these go down when you fast. So even Ramadan fasting, um, the Muslim holy month mm -hmm. where they're doing daytime fasting, which is really the opposite of circadian rhythm, yeah. but it's just giving your body a break from food. Mm -hmm. Even in those studies, they were found that even then, it brings down inflammation. So it's not just circadian, it's not just the sleeping and the eating and the circadian rhythms. There's something about fasting itself that's anti-inflammatory. And even if it happens to be during the day, it's better than not fasting at all. That's so fascinating. Yeah. It's like we're meant to give our body a break. And I just think of it as those little guys in our gut that need some rest, they need to relax. They can't be eating in the car, you know, before. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, when I was in training, when I was in residency training and I was so stressed out and tired, I was eating or drinking something almost every moment of the day until, until mm -hmm. right before bed because I was tired and I needed a coffee, then I needed Starbucks, then I needed a snack, then I needed candy, then, and that's, if you talk to most people, that's, that's very typical. So. What's the link then between stress and people eating? Oh yeah, so stress, our cortisol, our stress hormones, one of them is cortisol, our main one, um, is a signal to our brain of, of danger, right? So um, digestion is slowed because it's like, hey, uh, we're in a dangerous state, we need to need quick energy, right? To, in case we have to run away from some animal. Mm -hmm. And we can't digest kind of heavy foods. So you'll notice that when you're stressed, people can't digest things. They'll have GI trouble with foods, um, dairy and gluten and fiber even, vegetables, and they'll say, oh, I can't eat these foods. And when they deal with the stress and they bring down their cortisol levels, their digestion starts working again they're able to add those foods back. But it feels counterintuitive then, because so many people that I know, I don't know about you, that when they stress, the first thing they do is eat. And then yes. the first thing they do is eat sugar. Yes, yes. because you want quick energy when you're stressed. Oh. Your body is thinking, you're gonna need to run away from an animal. So you don't wanna take something that's slow digesting. You want something that's immediately gonna give you that hit. So when you're stressed, you reach for the coffee, you reach for the sugar, and you reach for the quick hits of energy. And that's why when you're stressed, you gain weight. Mm. 
mm. because you're skipping all the healthy foods for quick fixes because your body's thinking it's in danger mode. And it would rather have that than and know that it's a slow digestion. So do those two almost like kind of go in hand in hand where it's like, okay, you're stressed, you reach for the sugar because you need that quick energy and your digestion slowed. So now it actually doesn't absorb or digest the food. And so you end up gaining weight even more. Yes, exactly. Ooh. Like a double whammy. Yeah. And so you reach for things that are like, you are not gonna reach for a salad or a slow digesting. Your body just knows that, hey, that's not gonna give us the quick energy that we need. And we don't have the power to digest that. Just reach for the donut because that's going to give you quick energy and we don't need to, you know, do a lot of digestion processes. So you eat the donut, your sugar spikes, right? right? And you're ready to go. You have a quick energy for 45 minutes, an hour. Then it starts to drop and you're hungry again because mm -hmm. that's how blood sugar spikes work. And your body wasn't able to handle that big load of fat and calories that you just gave it because the digestion slowed. And so now you have stomach pain. Mm -hmm you have weight gain, and you have poor insulin control because it was not ready for that. So if we just tricked ourselves into believing it's quote unquote comfort food? No, because comfort food is the opposite. So comfort food is the things that we eat when we're stressed, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we think is comforting, yeah, yeah. but it's actually doing the opposite of comforting your body. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like we've kind of tricked ourselves yes. by calling it comfort food, yes. but it doesn't very it's not comfortable. Comfort. <laughs> it's not comfortable at all. In fact, we have neurological patterns in our brain that happen because from the time you were little, you might have been given a food that mistakenly you feel like is a comfort food mm. and you then reach for that over and over and over especially when you're stressed think about it when you're stressed kind of reach for the same stuff mm. it's a neurological pathway we want to protect our mm. our body's whole goal is to protect ourselves from being eaten by an animal so when we're stressed we're like wait what was that thing that we did that quickly oh. gave us energy and that's what we call comfort foods that's and I was always thinking, it's like, well, yeah, even growing up, I don't know about you, and maybe they don't do it now, but when I was a kid, you go to the dentist, they give you like a candy when yeah. you leave. Yeah. And it's like, you've already been under stress over being at the dentist with them prodding and proking your teeth, but then it's kind of rewarded with sugar. Oh, I think about that with like something like a Kit Kat. So when I was growing up, um, I'm an Indian immigrant, and when I was little, my dad loved Kit Kats, and so did I. And when we would do something fun together, he would get a Kit Kat for him and I. Mm. And I still, when I look at Kit Kats, when I go to the store and I don't buy them, but th if I'm having a bad day and I'm stressed, I'm thinking about how it made me feel mm -hmm. and how comforting that feeling was. And it's a neurological pathway that was set when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Can we retrain our bodies then? Because I'm always yes. about like, how do I trick quite don't quote myself um to get the results i really want so let's say for instance i am or someone at home is listening right now and they're like okay i really understand it but every time something hard happens i have an argument with my partner or you know break up or yeah your job is stressful like whatever they recognize the pattern but they're like i don't know how to unwind it it's a really hard thing to unwind but you can do it um one of the best ways to do it is using your neurological pathways through dopamine so dopamine is the way we get to our goals. Um, dopamine keeps us motivated on our way. And so way dopamine works is when you get little wins mm -hmm. along the way, it's more likely to keep you motivated. Mm -hmm. And you need intermittent surprise rewards. So for example, that's why gambling works so well. Mm -hmm. um, keeps people, because you don't know when you're gonna win and you get a little win and that spikes your dopamine. It's like, okay, keep going because we're getting there. So you wanna use that to your advantage. So if you're trying to train yourself to get to a healthier place, use the neurological pathways in a positive way. So if you have a goal that you're trying to get to, give yourself an intermittent reward that motivates you to get to that goal. Say you got to win, like, you know, your book was read by something, somebody you really, really admire give yourself an intermittent reward that day, internalize that win, mm. that will keep your, that will spike your dopamine and keep you on your path to 
impacting more, to creating more, to your final goal. And you can do that with food. You can do that in aspects of your life. When you have a little win that's surprising or that's just random, mm -hmm. celebrate it when it's on the path to something positive. And so when you, um, you're eating healthy and you feel good and you finish a workout and you feel good, reward yourself. Internalize that celebration as this is helping me on my way to changing my neural pathways. And does it matter if you reward yourself with like a big hunk of cake? <laughs> you want to use <laughs> rewards that are going to get you closer to your goal. Right. So if you're somebody, if you choose a healthy, a healthy snack, right? Or maybe you buy yourself a new workout outfit, which unfortunately is my way to reward myself on my health goals. Um, and so you get um, a new outfit and you feel good about it and you've rewarded it and it has to be intermittent and it has to be almost like a surprise. Like you don't want it to happen every Wednesday. Mm. You want it to happen intermittently and so that's why i say time it with a little win think about a little win that you had and reward yourself and make it regular but random mm. so would you advise that same thing with intermittent fasting because i've actually heard you say like i'm very much you tell me to do it okay i'm gonna do it yes right but like sometimes being that restricted or that hardcore actually doesn't serve us yes and so what do you suggest where people are listening right now and like okay i want to do intermittent fasting but maybe they're not able to sustain it on a daily basis yeah what's the advice there when i first started intermittent fasting i wanted to be a plus student because i'm south asian we have to be a plus <laughs> students right so um I did 16 hours, and then the next day I did 16 this hours. This is day one, right? Yeah. yeah. And the third day, day three, I was like, I'm exhausted. I'm hungry. Um, my sleep is poor. What the hell am I doing? And then I realized, wait a second. It's like running 20 miles on your first day mm -hmm. and then running 20 miles on your second day. And then running, you know what I mean? So you have to start with 12 hours. Then maybe the next day you push yourself, like I call it a push fast. You try 13 or 14 hours, but then you go back to 12 hours the next day. And then maybe you take a day off. Like you really need to train. It's a training for your metabolism. And it's not going to happen easily because when I explain to you how Americans eat, we're used to the sugar spikes and the sugar drops and then we need to eat again. So the first time you try intermittent fasting, you're probably going to feel that sugar drop and be like, oh my God, I'm dying, I'm, I'm jittery, I'm gonna need something. It's That's your blood sugar dropping because you're so used to those spikes and mm. those peaks and valleys. I always tell women, hey, how do you know when you've gone too far is do these check, this check-in, okay? How is your energy level? How is your sleep? How are your hunger slash cravings? And how are your hormones? And those things can tell you if you're on the right track in anything, fasting, any kind of intervention, nutritional change, how is it affecting your own body? Yeah. Personalize it to yourself because you can say 12 hours is great for someone, but hard for someone else. 14 hours is easy for someone, but really hard for another person. You check in with yourself to know. Yeah, my husband can easily do like 18 hours. Um, I, I find the 14 to 16 yeah. is like the me too. The beauty spot for 14 me. to 16, 14 to me is the beauty spot. And now I even do, I was talking to people on social media that I've been really trying to tighten my nutrition. And when I do that, I eat an early dinner and then I'm only able to fast like 12 to 13 hours mm -hmm. because if I stop eating at six, then in the morning I get up at six and I can do a fasted workout for an hour, but then I'm ready to eat because I tightened up on my nutrition, I'm tightening up on my sleep. And so you might not, you might notice as you go through different phases of your life, nutritional patterns, you can move from 12 hours, 13 hours, 14 hours, 15 hours, and back and forth depending on your activity level, when you stop your eating, because when you stop eating early in the evening, it's hard to stay fasted in the morning. Mm. And just for people at home, I want to make sure that they hear the difference between, because some people do say, right, but you're still starving yourself. And yeah. It is the key, the assessment that you just said, feel, see how your, your energy is, see yeah. how your sleep is. Because yeah. if you're starving yourself, the likelihood is your energy is very low. Yes. Your hunger is obviously very high. Your concentration's low, things yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. The difference between a diet 
and a lifestyle mm -hmm. is that the diet leaves you depleted of energy. Your hormones are crashing. You are feeling like you're, you're craving all these foods. Your sleep is disturbed. That is a toxic diet. Mm -hmm. When you know you're on the right path, you'll feel clearer, more energy. You'll have better sleep, better hunger, control of your hunger and cravings, and you will feel more in control of your emotions. That's when you know you're on the right path. And is it that you're still eating the same calories or the same amount of food, yeah. um, you're just condensing that time frame? Exactly. So when you naturally, so people eat 30% of their calories after dark, like after 8 p.m. Wow. So when you naturally do that, when you naturally cut out that late night snacking, you are going to eat less calories. And so that's why there's studies that show, hey, you can't just intermittent fast your way to weight loss. You have to also change the quality of your food. So be because what happens is sometimes, especially when you have altered physiology, so we know that people in America, or especially people who have a disease, um, uh, of metabolism like diabetes, obesity, um, their hunger hormones are off. And often, you know, even if you're intermittent fasting, you can eat more calories um, mm. in the time, even though naturally, if um, when your metabolism is working properly, you wouldn't. But so that's why people had said to me, oh, but there's a study that shows that you don't get weight loss just by decreasing your amount of hours and they did it on metabolically challenged people um, and they did it because you know i always joke like americans we can out eat anybody in any time frame you give us you know food unlimited food and we'll eat it even if it's a in a one hour mm. time frame so you can't just rely on that for weight loss but that's not really the goal anymore. That's what I was gonna ask you because if people fast too long, you then get really hungry and you become ravenous. And when you're ravenous, you just eat whatever. You eat whatever and I think that um, your body doesn't recognize, right, that you're full, like it's in like 30 minutes that yes. you need to do. So like all of this, I think, is rather confusing for a lot of people yeah. because um, they may try to do it as a fat loss thing, yeah. but they kind of cram everything in and they're not quite doing it right, is that? Yeah, when you break your fast, but how you break your fast is key. Because when I was in medical training, I fasted all the time by mistake. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to the lunchtime and they would give us free food. And I would gorge myself on whatever was at noon. Right. And I really did it poorly. So remember what I was telling you about the blood sugar spike. If the first thing you eat after you fasted all day is a bread basket or a bowl of chips, which is what we all do when we're at a restaurant, you know, first thing they give mm. you, you spike that blood sugar super, super high. And that's a signal to your brain that, they, oh, there's a lot of food coming, we better store. Um, and that spike of sugar turns on the processes of like a fat gain of um, all these inflammatory processes also. And that's really the big problem with our diets is that we have these spikes. And so what I tell people is remember when you break your fast or actually whenever you're eating, don't have that simple sugar, simple carb first. Um, don't do it first. Eat your protein and your fiber first. And so if you were eating breakfast, you might have your egg scramble or your tofu scramble with veggies first. Mm. Protein, fiber first. That's going to keep your hunger hormones at bay all day long. That's going to keep your moods and blood sugar even all day long. Then go to your healthy fats, maybe your avocado, your olive oil, and then have your, your if you want to have a simple carb, um, have it at the very end. So if you're out at dinner, even at dinner, you can time your food in a way that maybe you move the bread to the end of the meal with the dessert, and that's better oh. for you. But plus also you've already eaten your other food so you're less likely to probably eat it because you're already full. Yeah, when you eat that bread and that basket of chips in the beginning, your blood sugar spikes and do you know when it starts to fall? Right around dessert time. Mm. And so when you're starting to get that fall, you're gonna be like, oh, I'm ready for dessert and you end up completely overeating in the mm. meal. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and, but you also say like there are times in your, um, maybe it's the cycle that you shouldn't be intermittent fasting. Yes. When you're in the late luteal phase, 
the five to seven days before your period, if, if someone, you know, if you wanted to calculate in that way, mm -hmm. you're very sensitive to stress. Your hormones have bottomed out. Your body's ready to release, um, you know, getting ready to release the lining. It is not a good time to do stressful activities. The way exercise and inter intermittent fasting works is it's a stress, a good stress, mm. or hormetic stress. We call it a hormone stressor. And if you try to do it all, your crazy exercise, your crazy intermittent fasting schedule, your stressful life, that's too much stress mm. for your body to handle at that time. So is there certain foods then that you, so if you're like, okay, these are my, because I love everything you're saying. Yeah. Like I'm so freaking tight. I can literally, I'm ho really hoping people are home right now, getting out their calendar, yeah. they're making marks. They're like, yes. oh, this is when I need to go hard. This is when I'm going to run the marathon. This is when I'm yes. going to ask for that promotion. This yes. is when I'm going to ease up. When you ask for that promotion, when you go for it, you got to time that in your favor yeah. because we need to i mean women need to win we're we want women to win in this world and you have the power to do that and you give it your best shot at certain times of your cycle okay, okay i love this so is there certain foods yes. you should eat in certain times of your cycle because yes. you spoke about so beautifully again you're very tactical i love it on like what to eat in the day right you just yeah. break that down great like definitely don't start with sugar which is interesting because i'm sure so many people throw sugar in their coffee in the morning yes that's the worst way yeah that starbucks line when i hear the orders i'm like oh my god it used to be me I, you know, I got the caramel, frappuccino, macchiato, everything, right? You're giving yourself that blood sugar spike and setting your hunger hormones all day to be mm. chasing you. Mm. And you're setting yourself up for that drop about an hour or two later, and now you're hungry again. Is it kind of like when you drink alcohol, you know how it's like the hair of the dog where you feel so bad, but having another sip of alcohol actually makes you feel better? Is that what sugar's doing? Yeah. Where you start with the sugar and you feel crappy? So yes. then you go for more sugar because then it spikes you again, makes you feel better for yes. momentarily. So you're going through these spikes yeah. and then these valleys and you go for another spike. Yeah. And what it ends up doing is your moods then depend on your ingestion wow. of sugar yeah. because then you're going to be like, I feel hangry right now, but that's your blood sugar dropping. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly in that cycle, you need it to keep your energy and mood up. And so people are constantly eating every hour or two hours to keep that blood sugar spiked. Yeah. And that's why. So what you wanna do, the cup, that late luteal phase where you feel crappy, where you're stressed, you're gonna crave sugary foods because your serotonin's low and your body wants a boost of mood. Mm. And what really boosts your mood really quickly? You know, a sugary snack, right? But, this is also the time where your hormones are not working for you when it comes to metabolism. So the exact time that you crave the cake and the cookies is a time you shouldn't really be eating it. Of course it is. For your <laughs> metabolism. So what you do is pick high fiber foods that mm. give you that boost. Like this is a time where oatmeal or sweet potato, they have good carbohydrate. I mean, they're carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not good or bad. So it's full of fiber and it gives you that serotonin boost that you want without really giving you that blood sugar spike and mm. that metabolism hit that comes with a big candy bar or piece of cake. And so choose things with high fiber. Maybe you eat a big salad and then you have your chocolate. Um, and you know, and I'm not, I have my chocolate. I mean, have your chocolate, please yeah, have your chocolate, yeah. please have your desserts. Don't deprive yourself of foods that you love, but do it in a way that supports your biology. And when you're intermittent fasting, is there any foods that you should be eating during that? Because you're intermittent fasting with your cycle, that it goes together? Or is it like, no, when you intermittent fast, you these are the foods that are better for you? Oh, right, okay. So when you're intermittent fasting, according to circadian rhythm, according to your cycle, according to your inner signals, you eat in the same way all the time. You want to eat high fiber foods with a low blood sugar spike. And so we call it low glycemic index mm -hmm. because you're, you're eating in a way that you don't wanna counteract all the hard work that you did by eating all the sugary food during the time that you have your eating window. And then one, it's gonna be impossible to fast because your blood sugar is gonna be on a roller coaster. Mm. 
and two, you're basically shortchanging um, the benefits. So you really want to clean up the way you eat and how you eat, the order of foods you eat, um, and sync it with your cycle. So like that week before your period, you're going to crave, naturally crave more carbohydrate rich foods. But you can do that in a way that supports your biology and not feel deprived like, oh, I want to have something, you know, like comforting, but I can't because, uh, you know, mm. it's uh, you're trying to restrict yourself. That's what I was going to ask is the restriction as well that I think can mess with a lot of people's minds. Yes. Um, I used to when I had a very unhealthy relationship with food before my gut. That's why I had ended up having gut issues. Yeah. Um, I was the person that's like, okay, I've heard that eating six meals a day is the best thing to do. And so I was having small meals, but I was told, you know, like carbs are bad and fat yeah. is bad. So I ended up being on like this rabid starvation where I was basically just on protein. Yeah. And so of course I was starving all the time, Yeah. but I wouldn't allow myself to eat. If I told myself I was going to eat at 2 p.m., and it was 1.58 and I was starving, I would wait till 2 p.m. Yeah. So that obviously was a very unhealthy habit, a very yes. unhealthy mindset. Um, so that is one of my concerns yeah. with intermittent yes, fasting. Yes, 100%. I used to have an app that would help me track how long I was fasting for. And I realized, oh, this is, I've just swapped one unhealthy behavior yes. with another unhealthy behavior. Yes, and white knuckling, I always say that is a bad sign. If you're white, yeah, you wanna go to bed not full. And so you might be like, I could have a snack right now, but I'm not going to. Mm. But if you're like starving and white knuckling, you can't fall asleep, that's a sign that you need something and it's okay to break your fast or have something small. Like I, I allow, I always say, have yourself a 45 to 50 calorie snack that's high in fat because you don't want to break your fast. Protein and carbs break that fast. Mm. And see how you feel. If you're still starving, just eat. Don't want to white knuckle it. You want to have a positive relationship with food. Women in this world, we have such a negative relationship with food. Food is not good or bad and, uh, you know, off limits foods. And women come to me and they say, but corn is bad. Oh, but gluten is bad, but dairy is bad. And you're left with nothing to eat. And then you end up with a very poor relationship, a mental health issue. And so I think that that's the bigger societal issue is like really to break down that relationship with food. And biggest thing that I did is I focus on strength. How much mm. energy, how much strength mm. do I feel? And that helps you develop. It's not about being skinny and smaller. Like in my upbringing in my culture in the in women culture we're told we got to be smaller and we have to be tiny and we got to retract mm -hmm. and we have to you know stay kind of um folded and i think that if you keep in your mind that you want to get stronger and you want your energy to get bigger then you start to lose that restriction and that poor relationship if, with food and just with society in general like i remember i was tell this story I was at Columbia doing my immunology fellowship and we would have these big round table meetings where all the fellows, which we, could, we call them fellows, would sit around the table and I wouldn't take a seat at the table because it was all men. Um, it was all males and uh, nobody who was like me or looked like me or acted like me. I would sit in the back and I would like try to like melt into the chair, into the background because I didn't want anyone to notice me. Not because I didn't have anything to say. I had a lots of things and ideas to say, but culture had taught me that, you know, I didn't, I'm supposed to be small and meek and quiet. And I think that's what happens with food. Like we restrict because we want to be smaller mm. and no, it's about getting stronger, getting louder and getting in tune with your convictions and when you start to do that your relationship with food with society changes do this so freaking powerful because i went for 20 years 25 years 30 years maybe with a very unhealthy relationship with food and i am um, 
it, it comes from childhood, seeing my mum very much calorie restrict. And so um, I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. And the way that I broke it, A, was my gut just fell apart. And I was like, oh, I've yeah. done this to myself. Yeah. This is 20 years of treating my body like it didn't matter. And so that was a big wake up call for me. But to pivot the mindset and the unhealthy way of thinking about food is exactly what you just said. Because I said to myself, this isn't going to If I have this mindset on food for the rest of my life, I'm going to die early. I'm going to be unhappy mm -hmm. and I'm not going to enjoy life. And so I, was, I recognized why I needed to change. Yeah. And then it was, but how do I change? Because there's one thing to tell people, well, just make sure you don't eat this. There's a whole other thing when all your whole history of mindset and belief and habit come into play. And so the strength part, girl, I'm so glad you said that. I, th I trashed the scale. That yeah. was number one. And every day I just asked myself, how do I feel? Yeah. And do that check-in. Do, you know, people who are watching or listening, do the check-in. Mm -hmm. Do the energy, hunger, craving, sleep, hormonal check-in and say, how do I feel today mm -hmm. with what I'm doing with my life? And if you feel good, that means you're exercise, you're fasting, you're eating, your life is on the right track. Yeah. Oh man, I could talk to you forever. I Honestly, you, you are fantastic. Your book, I'm So Effing Tired, has literally, when I read it, it was such a beautiful blueprint that I think everyone needs to go and get so that they can really be the freaking heroes of their own life. Take the control back. Earn, earn the confidence and then really be able to show up to be the person they want to be. Yeah. So where can they find you? Where can they find the book and all the amazing things you're I doing? I love it. Thank you. So I'm at amymdwellness.com. That's my website. That's the hub. I'm at fastingmd on Instagram. Um, I'm at amyshotmd on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and my book is called I'm So Effing Tired. And, you know, uh, it was chosen to be one of the top five business books of 2021. Uh, because it's about business, everything. Mm -hmm. It's not just about health. It's about mindset. It's about how to live your life in the best way because we're all burned out. We're all tired and we all need solutions. Hell yeah. Guys, guys, this literally uh, is a total blueprint of everything we've been talking about for you to step in and be the hero of your own life. So go check it out. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And guys, if this episode brought you value, please, please do like and subscribe and tell your mates to come check out this episode in particular so they can also be freaking confident like this woman here has put in this book with all the gems. So please, please go follow her, get the book. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace. And on top of all this, women are twice as likely as men, or almost twice as likely as men, to develop Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia on the planet, which means that for every man with Alzheimer's disease, there are two.